Greetings. On behalf of the board of Akom Kesi, I give praise to the Abbasum, mm -hmm. our ancestors, and Mother Earth. Welcome to another edition of the Akom Kesi Lecture Series. I'm Yael Tyus, and I'll, I'm a board member of Akom Kesi, and I'll also be your MC for today's gathering. Our lecture series is an extension of the work that culminates with our major conference every August. During this conference, we gather to foster camaraderie, fellowship, and networking. We create, maintain, and strengthen families, and friendships. We share wisdom, knowledge, and information that facilitates cultural growth and expression, and we showcase members of the Akan community. If you'd like more information about Akon Kesi, you can find it at akoncenter.org. That's akoncenter.org. Today's topic is Black femininity in America, leadership and submission. Is femininity valuable? Is masculinity valuable? What is leadership? What's submission? Are they related? Should they be reconceived? We'll talk about these topics and much more today. But before we dive in, at least dive in all the way, a little bit about myself. I'm a husband, father of five, and a proud son, brother, and friend. I also have a weekly blog where information is published that supports readers with creating a loving culture in their relationship. And in addition, we have a weekly call for sisters on Tuesdays and at 7 p.m. and one for brothers on Thursdays at 7 p.m. called Creating a Loving Culture in Our Relationship. And information on the blog and the call can be found at franklove.com. Okay, let's get going. Before I introduce everyone, I'm gonna take a liberty and pose an opportunity for the men. So starting from the most senior, I'm gonna ask Doc, would you please share with us a thought or a sentiment that honors feminine energy? Doc, you there? He's muted. He muted. I, I thought you told me to mute and then I forgot to unmute. Okay. <laughs> Want to say Habari Ghani to everybody? It's good to see you. Habari Ghani. Habari Ghani. Gemma. That's a, that, oh, hey. You're Gemma, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. You're with me. I think uh, Mary McLeod Bethune summed up how I feel about women very nicely when she said that next to God, we are indebted to women. First for life itself, and then for making that life worth living. All right. <laughs> That's a complete, absolutely complete answer right there. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm giving credit to Mary McLeod Bethune because um, when I read it, it struck home. And she deserves it. Thank you. Kwesi, what you what you what do you have? Would you share a uh, a sentiment that honors feminine energy and women? Well, for me, I think the the thing is the the way that I honor it in my my mind is knowing that I'm not always right. So for me, you know, you could be macho, you could be bravo and think that your way is always the way, but with the feminine energy, it brings a different perspective, a, a different um, perspective to whatever the situation is. So for me to honor that is just being conscious of like, you know what, you don't know everything and you need to always be um, <laughs> concerned about the other side of that, that creates that balance. So that's, that's how I'll honor it. Great, thank you. And Brother Quow. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think I'll reference um, James Brown when he um, said it's a man's world, but it wouldn't be nothing without a woman <laughs> or a girl. So uh, for me, uh, masculinity has no purpose without femininity. So, and, and I would like to, you know, just kind of piggyback on what the elder said is life it, that's the source of life, and it gives life its purpose and and renewal of life. So, and, and makes life enjoyable. <laughs> so, so um, it, Ashe, Ashe. Hey, <laughs> femininity makes it all worthwhile. <laughs> so, 
so as men and as a masculine principle, no purpose is had without the feminine. Thank you. And to, to add my two cents to all of it, as a father of three, three young ladies, as a fa as a husband, as a son, as a nephew, I, 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 feminine energy and women, they are, they are, they give so much purpose and and drive to everything, everything in my in my world. It me women and feminine energy. They mean so much to me. They give such a uh, context to to all that I do, and I appreciate I appreciate each of you, and I appreciate what you bring. Okay. Come on, tell me, don't get um. You got Nana, uh, on. He's not a panelist. I don't oh, think. Okay. Yes. So he's he's a. Uh, he, but we're going to give him an opportunity to weigh in. We're going to give everybody an opportunity to weigh in. Right now, we just we just with the panelists for, gotcha. for so we got a great panel today, and most the most senior, I affectionately call Doc. Doc is a licensed psychologist in the District of Columbia and in Maryland. He's also a discipline, uh, a disciple, of intuitive and epistemo epistemological psychology. On the artistic side, Doc is the creative composer and writer of plays, articles and music that are used in meditation and habit changing. His specialties include neurocognitive psychology, clinical and social psychology, measurement theory, music is therapy, bibliotherapy, and psychological foundations of education. Doc is also the product of an HBCU. And as I read through all of the bios, I think all of us are. <laughs> Uh, his HBCU is Virginia State University. Actually, I believe it was Virginia State College when he graduated. All right. He further matriculated. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. I get it? I get it? <laughs> he further matriculated at Indiana University and, and was graduated at the PhD level by the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And last, perhaps his greatest accomplishment is his marriage of over 50 years before the passing of his beloved wife a few years ago, and of course his children. So family, please welcome Dr. James Moses Ballard II to our collective today. Welcome, Doc. That's Doc. sign language for you. <laughs> <clears throat> Doc, is there a relationship between feminine energy and being a woman? And if so, what is it? What's the relationship? Well, this, this of course, is a opening Pandora's box. Yeah. <laughs> but the way we are um, giving nomenclature to different things today, it's difficult to answer because um, we have kind of fluctuated on what is a woman. Yes. And before you throw something up. You know, we're in, right now we're in debate about um, the swimmer, Kia, should he compete in women's sports? Is it swimmer? We don't know. But feminine energy is no question about that. And it is present in men. And in men, it is called uh, anima. According to Jung's uh, theory, it's called anima. And um, it's present in women, it will still be anima in women. So feminine energy is there and there are certain characteristics that are given to it, some of which would be um, positive, I guess. Some of them would be negative, depending on how you want to define women. For instance, being artistic, being patient, being kind, being nurturing, but there are women today who think some of those are insulting or, or do not really speak to the warrior characteristic of women. So you put me in a 
bucks here, y'all. I don't know which way I should go because last time I got written up by the Afro-American for making a statement that turned out to get some kind of side note in the paper. But I think there is a difference between feminine energy and woman. I think woman is more of a nomenclature. And I think feminine energy is a very natural and biological predisposed um, part of attribute of human beings granted by the mysterious spirit. Thanks, Doc. Our next most senior panelist is mother, as a mother who I've had the pleasure of knowing for, I believe, all of my life. She's a queen mother for the Washington DC, Virginia, Maryland, Canada, and Bermuda regions of the Aceraset Society International. She's been a member of the Aceraset Society International since 1975 and shortly thereafter began her priesthood training where she learned and ascribed to the Aserian tradition asserting that we are all divine beings and our true nature is peace. She was installed as Queen Mother in 1987 by His Royal Majesty Shechem or Shechem, Ra Un Nefer Amen I, the King of Kings and the Chief Priest of the Aserset Society International. Thus, she served as a Queen Mother for over 35 years. As an Aserset Society leader, she has extensive counseling experience in various subjects, including spirituality, personal development, relationships, health, and healing, including pregnancy, childbirth, women's, children's, and family health concerns, education, and other life decisions. For 48 years, she successfully used vegan diet, meditation, herbalism, homeopathy, and other traditional methods of healing for herself, her family, and her friends. She loves teaching, partnering with, and thus empowering others to take ownership of the health and well being of themselves, their family, and their community. Finally, she's a mother, aunt, grandmother, godmother, and a wife for over 45 years. She is Uruat Enen Chas Ra and Common. And she gives us, and she gives all praises to God and the ancestors for the blessings of family in America. And, her, and in her true home of Africa. Uruat, welcome. Is there a relationship between feminine energy and being a woman? And if so, what is it? I had to pull everyone, peace and blessings. Peace I just blessings. want to first say thank you, y'all, for this opportunity to share and come together with others to, you know, really talk about topics that the Western culture tends to sidestep or the perspective is not our necessarily our perspective. But first thing I want to say is that, you know, we live a life, uh, we're all spiritual beings, first of all. And so we can categorize femininity, we can categorize masculinity, but first of all, there's spirit, okay? And so that's why, that's the reason why there's femininity in men and masculinity in women, because spirit is all encompassing, it, it encompasses everything. So your question is, what is the difference between, can you repeat the question again? So is, well, is there a relationship between feminine energy and being a woman? And if so, oh, what is that relationship? Yeah, the relationship is that we were God, <laughs> God given certain talents that are, tend to be more awake in women. You know, we're the ones who have the eggs that, you know, allow us to carry offspring and allow us to nourish those offsprings and give birth. That's not something that men do. So there absolutely have to be particular characteristics that women carry 
in order to be able to manage that, in order to be able to accomplish that, in order to, and I'm not saying men don't have a purpose in that, that, you know, to have a partner, to have someone to assist with that is, is ever important as much as possible. However, mm-hmm. whether you have a partner or not, you're built for that. Some people get to experience it in their lifetime and some people do not. But that does not mean that the, you know, the actual trappings or the actual ability isn't there. And there's something that happens when you um, reach puberty. You know, I was uh, worked in adolescent health and women's health. And there's something that goes on when women reach puberty that is very different that goes on when men reach puberty. So there's definitely a relationship. Femininity, you know, people look at certain characteristics and call that femininity. As Doc said, you know, it's kind of getting blurred, but, you know, and people have different definitions of that. But the characteristics that, as in our tradition, are set represents the great mother. Certain things that can be, um, you know, correspond, correspondences you can make with Osset and the Great Mother, which as he said, were nurturing and accommodating. And, but, you know, in terms of, you know, you look at the ocean, ocean is a metaphor for Osset. And you look at the ocean and the ocean can be very smooth and very calm and very, you know, peaceful and enticing and cool. But then there are times when it can be very cold and it can be, you know, it can be very strong. You can have some very strong waves and wind, et cetera, as a part of the ocean. And women have to have that strength as well. Women, that doesn't necessarily mean that's masculinity. That's women's strength. That's women's ability to manifest and hold on to their particular uh, aspects of God. So yes, there's a relationship between femininity and women. Thank you. A good one. A, a, a strong one. one. A very fine <laughs> one. Yes. Yeah. I'm. I'm curious. You touched on it a little bit, and so did Doc. Um, how? What do we do with? Oh boy, how to put this? What do we do with the 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 energy that's that's kind of, that's culminating around the lines blurred and and like almost men having children, you know, men, like men, some men wanting to bear children and science getting to the place where they are doing that. I mean, any any thoughts on, on that, that you care to share? You or Doc, but we'll start with you, Odua. I would say that we already know that there are forces that have you know, alter nature. Let's just say that. There are forces that have altered nature. And so therefore, people are put in certain positions because of the alter of their physique, their mental health, et cetera, where they, um, you know, through the diet, through the environment, through perhaps purposeful, um, injections of things, you know, it puts people in a position where they are not necessarily on the same natural path that we were on some time ago. I would say that. And so therefore, you know, how do you cope with that? How do you work with that? Well, you have to make sure that your family is you know, well cared for, well versed, well understood. I mean, I, as a healthcare professional, I always had to be non-judgmental of people, mm-hmm. you know, and so therefore you don't necessarily, unless you walked in a mile in somebody else's shoes, you don't know why necessarily they're taking on a certain um, ma- way of living. Let's yes. put it that way, Yes. you know, a certain way of living some of it again can be environmental and their susceptibility 
to what other people are preaching, teaching, et cetera. But some of it may physi actually is physiological. And again, there are some people who are promoting uh, a, a certain way of living that isn't necessarily what someone would do, but they're susceptible to what's being promoted. So that's the other thing that there's people out there promoting that because they really want they don't want us to reproduce <laughs> and they don't want reproduction of, of certain people to continue. So therefore, you know, we're in that position, but also because of what has happened to our black, our brothers over many millennia in terms of war, incarceration, castration, lynching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because we are not in a culture that allows for sharing and caring, you're left with a lot of women who don't have a partner, who don't have a mate, and there's not a mate available for them to have. So, and then what's going on with the men? Again, men have been castrated mentally and physically. So sometimes people just get into a comfort zone. Would you please speak to the sharing and caring? Um, what and, and would you speak to the, I mean, and, and what, uh, what I automatically extract from what you said is polygamy, um, where, where when they're not enough, like you said, I mean, you, you actually said it, there are not enough men for women, for all of the women to have mates. So how does that, uh, speak to that, please. Because Specifically because in this country, I would say you're at a deficit. Okay. Not necessarily if you go to other countries, although they're trying, like if you go to West Africa, they're, although they're trying to, you know, annihilate as many people as possible, you know, this it's not just uh, black people, but it's population control, period. You know, that's one of Bill Gates' agenda, mm -hmm. population control. But um, in terms of, sharing and caring, I'm saying because we are not given a foundation, a spiritual foundation. You, you don't have that foundation growing up unless you're in a community that's pr promoting that. You don't have that. And so therefore the even concept of, of women um, sharing a man is generally given a bad rap. You know, if you even if you've ever looked at that show, Sister Wives, you know, you look at that and you're like, mm, I don't want to be I don't want <laughs> who wants to be involved with the drama that goes on. But that type of drama doesn't have to go on, but it has to do with people's spiritual foundation, their upbringing and their ability to um, have a relationship with God. That's what I would say. Uh, you said communities where it's promoted, and I, I think that it's. I think it's also nurtured. So where uh, uh, polygamous interactions can be nurtured, because you know it's one thing to promote it to happen to you know a man to take a second wife or more. It's another to actual nurture that that shall we say organization over over time because. The relationships, I mean, uh, marriages with just one man, one woman, they go through challenges. So marriages with multiple partners are definitely going to go through challenges also. Uh, and a community that nurtures them is undoubtedly going to be important and necessary. Well, I'm basically saying the larger society does not promote that or nurture it. That's right. And so you have to have some other type of foundation to be able to manage that within the larger society and to and to stick to it. You know, Indeed. so I, you know, I have a personal experience with it. I don't want to go through it right now, but I, you know, I have more than one uh, co-wife and that has been for 30 years or more. So I'm not tooting our horn. I'm just saying that if it were not for God and the ancestors, we couldn't do it. Not in this, not in this environment. But if you go to West Africa, it's absolutely common. Understood. Yeah. And where does 
leadership and and submission if 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 they fall into this conversation where do they fall in well are you asking me yes i will say that leadership you can only have leadership if you're willing to follow something or someone you know if you're willing to follow certain principles and values if you're willing to perhaps have you know in our tradition you know we are here to cultivate we're divine beings and we're here to cultivate our own personal relationship with the divine with the supreme being with god whatever you wish to call um but that's our fundamental um desire and our fundamental quest in life we all have purpose which may be different paths but we all have a collective path and that's to elevate elevate from the animal um human form that we're that we're born into into the divine so therefore leadership you can't have unless you're willing to follow and willing to submit to god and the word of god and the will of god that's our that's my position on it so once you do that once you're willing to do that then you can you know tap into the attributes that you have that you know and 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 create and build more talents you know some people are born with certain talents in terms of leadership and that doesn't mean that that's the be all end all you have to there are certain things that you have to hone there's maybe certain talents that you're not born with leaders need to be insightful leaders need to be humble leaders need to be um willing to listen and hear not just direct and order so you know those are certain attributes that everybody doesn't necessarily have but you have to be willing to cultivate them and learn the lessons that you will learn because you will be put into le lesson learning if you're planning to be a leader and and in mate and family relationships there has to be compromise there has to be cooperation there has to be collective work and responsibility you know there has to be duty there has to be loyalty and so you know that that that's something that each person has to cultivate so everyone has their parts and you might have a woman who was out of the household leading in terms of bringing in the money because she has that talent right there and you might have a man who is taking care of the household because he has that talent. So that doesn't necessarily mean he's not masculine and that doesn't mean she's not feminine. That just means that at that point in time, you know, that's where their talents lie and doesn't mean you can't cultivate something else. So, but you know, for many years, women were happy to be at home and cook and clean and take care of the children and all of that. But that's just, you know, we're we're at a deficit financially in this in this environment in the West. So, you know, women have been able to do that. Although someone, I just want to say one thing. Someone said to me yesterday that their person was somebody was doing a was someone was doing a paper. Oh yes. Uh, my mom, mom's neighbor's son is in college, and he said that the CDC had just put out something where black men are the most responsible, are the most involved, single black fathers are the most involved with their children than anyone else. And his son is doing a paper on that right now. He, 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 he brought it up because uh, I have a son who raised his daughter she, from seven years old to she's now 21. And he was saying that the CDC had just put something out saying that black single black men are the most responsible when it comes to their children. And so he said, you know, it's fi fi finally someone is giving the black man some props when it comes to their children. Beautiful. And a black woman is reminding us of that research. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> oh. Doc, is there anything that you want to say that you're inspired to say right now? Yes, I think I think we have to realize 
that um, our ancestry is Eastern psychology, Eastern wisdom, and we're living in a Western oriented way of thinking. Much of the stuff that they say here and that I learned as a psychologist studying what Western people thought, I have had to modify to fit what I've actually seen and lived through and personally experienced. So polygyny, polygyny, polyandry, all of that is okay, acceptable, has always been. Jews did it, everybody did. Romans didn't do it because they liked little boys. Now that was okay if Romans liked little boys, why not? Everybody has <laughs> to rock their own boat. So I, I think as we talk and as other people talk, let, let, let's don't forget that we're, we're dealing with more than one school of knowledge. Here in the West, we think we can create life. We think so many things. I'm not going to name them all because I'm surely going to step on some toes. And last time, as I said, I was written up in the newspapers for what I said. But we have to recognize that there's so much more that we do not know. If you know anything other than yourself, then you're going in the wrong direction. The proper study of people is themselves. So I can't tell you about all these all this other kind of stuff as, a, as an individual. As a psychologist, I will say what I learned because that's a body of knowledge. But I think that um, there's a place for polygamy, for polygyny, for, for all of that based on a lot of factors. We focus on screwing, on the sex. That is not the basis of polygamy, but that's what we think of here in the West. So we engage in serial cheating on our mates. <laughs> Case in point, Jada Pinkett Smith. That's all, that's all I want to say, because you know I could talk. So I'll just stop <laughs> because I want to hear some of the other people. Don't laugh. I'm serious. I'm trying to I'm be smiling. Serious. I'm not I'm laughing. No, we're not <laughs> laughing. We're enjoying what you're saying. Absolutely. Yes, enjoying. we are with you 100%. No. Yes, I'm totally absolutely. Drop all the knowledge. Drop all the knowledge. I've met my people, y'all. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'm done. Okay. All right. Our next panelists are a couple, and they are being presented as a unit. They first met as undergraduates at Fisk University and they've been married for over 25 years. They have three children and are now in the empty nester phase of their relationship. Their eldest has her master's degree in theater and dance. Their middle child is completing her RN at Albany State University and their youngest child is in his second year at Rhode Island College. They're both successful in their own rights. She's a court appointed referee who oversees orders of protection, child custody, paternity, and guardianship matters in the New York State Family Court. He is a PhD, a chemist, and a semi-retired professor, professor and university administrator who currently runs Recycle for Education, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to environmental education and justice issues. They've shared that their marriage has surely had its ups and downs, but their dedication to family has made them stronger and better as a unit. Both understand the significance of being role models for their children and the important role that each of them plays in the lives and development of their children and other children within their community. Please welcome Dr. Kwesi and Mrs. Andrea Omoa. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Kwesi. Yeah, okay. well. You are now talking to a couple that's in college, the same age that you were when you all met. What do you want them to know, both of them, about the respect of feminine energy? What would I want them to know? What do you want them to know? Yes. Um, I think the 
the, the major thing, the major take home would be is to respect each other, um, regardless of how you might feel in a particular situation in terms of something that you're dealing with, or you, you might just feel that you're right in terms of the direction that you're going. And my, my biggest thing between in terms of with this relationship, these college age kids would be is to, to manage, just to have that respect. And with that respect, I think all the other issues will work out. And then I think a big thing also here in this country or in this, I don't know if it's just this country, but we have this thing of ownership, like you own the person while well, you're my woman which means like I own you, I don't own you. You are sharing a relationship with this person and you have to respect that person's opinions, thoughts, emotions, all that, and not get into this ownership piece that we find ourselves in. And I think it leads to a whole lot of different issues and problems within relationship because you decide that, you know, this person is your property now and that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. Andrea, you are now talking to an audience full of the parents that you work with in the New York State system. <laughs> but right now, you are not a working professional. You're their sister. What do you want them to know? And this is men and women in the audience. What do you want them to know about feminine energy? I would have to go off of what Kwesi said. You have to respect each other. Because once you respect, you can learn to trust. But in um, reference to a couple that has children, your children are sponges. So whatever they see, however they see you relate to their spouse, that's what they're going out in the world to look for. So if you're disrespecting your spouse, if you're disrespecting yourself and your mannerisms, they're picking everything up. So all the things that you say, you know, sometimes as adults, we have the tendency to say, do as I say, not as I do. But that doesn't work with children. They're sponges. So whatever negativity they see, how they see you relate to one another, that is exactly the type of individual subconsciously or consciously that they're going after in their lives. So if you want to create a great community and good role modeling, you must show your children how you deal with conflict because everybody is not always sun and, and rainbows, but you can disagree with each other respectfully. And I think that's one thing people need to know. Your children are sponges. Whatever you do, they are going to mimic. They're going to take it and regenerate it. Uh, I was recently having a conversation with myself and do you answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've got some of an answer. I, and and I've, I believe that one, and you're, you're a great person to talk to about this. I believe that one of the most common forms of, I don't use this term loosely, but ch let's call it child abuse, is disagreements among parents. Par and I, it doesn't even have to be big disagreements. And it doesn't have to be like punching each other. Just... The, the general disposition of being unable to work together. I think that's a form of child abuse. And I'm having this conversation as I just look over, I, I look over my own life. Um, I, am, I am married, divorced, married. I've uh, been currently married for 18 years. And I'm, this, this, like I said, it's a conversation I'm having with myself. I'm curious, what do you think about the, the possibly abusive nature of familial discontent and the inability, or in, when I say familial, it doesn't even have to be two parents who are still together. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the, the, the discontent and the um, toxicity comes in when you show lack of respect. I mean, like I said, people argue, people disagree, and that's okay. That's a part of your development. But learning how to have that disagreement in a respectful manner, that's where the quote unquote emotional impairment of your children would come along because you're not teaching them conflict resolution. You're not teaching them how to disagree and come up with solutions that can work. 
So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree with that in the sense that, you know, for us, like whenever we're into an argument or wherever we just disagree, I'm like, you know what? I don't even want to talk anymore. And I know for some women that becomes a big thing. Like, I want to talk right now. I want to. I'm like, you know what? I don't want to talk. So when you calm yourself down and we, we can come together and to talk together as uh, adults, then we can resolve the issue. But all this cussing and screaming and fighting and stuff. It's not my cup of tea. And when you're angry, you're going to say some things that you don't necessarily mean. So you really want to have cooler heads prevail. But I mean, it's okay to have um, a disagreement and which is fine. And your kids should see that things aren't going to always be rosy. Things aren't going to always be peachy cream, but how you resolve those issues and how you um, deal with it becomes a foundation of how they will also deal with similar situations in their adult lives. And that comes with respect because all the years that um, we have been together, he's never called me out of my name. He's never disrespected Although me. Although I wanted to, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we all want to, <laughs> but right. what you do, it, you know, it's a form of respect. And that also turns into leadership and trust. Because if I can't trust him, then I can't follow him. I can't allow him to be my leader. I can't show him deference when I disagree with him. If I don't trust him, he is my provider. He is my protector. And I am 100% confident that that's what he's going to do. But if I don't trust he's going to do that, when we have those disagreements and that animosity and those, those words come up and that emotional discontent and the vile words start coming out because you don't have the foundation of trust and the foundation of respect. But I did hear something one day and I've this, what I heard, it's this movie, but when I heard it, that's actually how I adjusted myself and was able to be more susceptible to following my husband. The saying is, the husband is the head of the household, which is true, but the woman is the neck and she can make the head turn any way she wants to. And once I listened to that, boom, good. Presentation. Right. <laughs> so one, which something you said will, some ears will perk up and some will have problems with it. Others think it's natural. And that was following your husband. You, I mean, based on what you've said, you clearly follow your husband. There's not, you have been, and my, based on what I heard is unequivocal in that. What do you say to women who have a problem saying like that would, that would, they would hate to say something like that and probably hate to hear you say it. What do you say to them? Well, when I say I follow my husband, my husband also follows me. When people say a relationship is 50-50, I don't agree with that because if it's 50 50 it moves nowhere you're at a stalemate someone always has to have that 51 percent for it to move now in some cases i might have that 51 percent, and my husband will follow me but like i said i live my life as he is the head of the household so if he makes a decision that i don't agree with I'm going to tell him. It's not as if I'm going to blindly follow him and blindly submit to that. I show him deference. But what I'm is also, deference? Well, deference is a form of respect and I'll listen to what he says, but I'm also going to share my opinions to see if his point of view will change. I'm going to respect what he's saying and this is the way you want to go. Okay, I'm going to show you deference and I will follow your lead. However, these are my warning signs. If I tell you that shit and you're going to step in that shit, you can't say I didn't tell you. Okay. The I'm I'm curious about how how th that has um how that shows up when okay, your your husband says I think we should drive to New York going um Route one. 
uh, you know, route one slower. I don't know if you know from DC. Um, so that's my that's my reference point. I think we should drive to New York going route one today. And you're like, route one? What you? I mean, route one slow. You going to take twice as much time. And you think he should take 95. And you say, I think you should take 95. But you you say, all right. But you want to do route one? We'll do route one. Now, route one ends up taking not just twice as long, let's say three times as long. Do you say- I told you so? Yes, do you take say I told you so? Or do you say nothing? Sometimes, it depends. Sometimes I'll say I told you so. Other times I'll be like, well, this is, this is the choice that you made and I'm still with you. I'm with, I'm right or die, regardless. Regardless. Okay. But in the same turn, he knows, just like I know he's not going to lead me wrong, I'm not going to lead him wrong. And that's one of the things he's learned throughout his relationship to understand my point of view and sometimes hear what I'm saying. Quasi, how does it feel to be told I told you so? It doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not a big deal. Look, like I said, I'm not always right. Um it's okay. I'm 99% right, but you know, every 1% 99.5, baby. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but uh, I mean, I don't I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think that's part of just being human and growing and to understand that you are not perfect and you are going to make mistakes and you are going to have some vulnerable times where you do make things, but one of the things that my father always told me is that there's no such thing as, a, as a, a wrong mistake or a bad decision. You know, I usually make a decision based on the information that I have at that time. But if I get additional information after the fact that I can always go back and second guess it and say, hey, yeah, I should have did this, I should have did that. But now I have new information on that particular situation. But at that time, that was the right decision. So knowing that uh, and um, growing to that level of maturity, don't beat myself up over mistakes. Understood. The, the final couple that I'll introduce are also college sweethearts. They met at Tuskegee University in 1992. And did I say something wrong? No, no, no. no it's no, Tuskegee, no. right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> In 1992, because I, just as a quick aside, I I have a, a strong affinity to Fisk and Tuskegee, and they're, as, a, as far as I know, they are small universities, they're small HBCUs, but they're very powerful and they have very rich histories, and mm -hmm. I could easily get them mixed up. Um, so that's an aside. No, you, um, you're on it, brother, you're on it. <laughs> all right. So, uh, and they were married legally in 1999. They have three wonderful children, ages 26, 23, and 12, and both have been spiritual practitioners of a comb for over 20 years. He's a licensed clinical neuropsychologist, as well as a certified clinical sex offender treatment specialist in the state of Maryland, as well as the District of Columbia, and a clinical coordinator at the Center for Children in St. Mary's. Uh, this, location is loca this location is in rural uh, Maryland. He received his master's and doctorate in community psychology at Florida a and University, and his doctoral level training in neuropsychology was from Howard University. In addition to his professional practice, he's also been a spiritual practitioner within the Akom tradition of the Akan people of Ghana for over 25 years. And he and his wife currently have their own shrine house at Surgery Ahemfi, he was installed as a Brafo Henny in 2003 by the elders of Nana, uh, the Nana Sergebi Shrine in Kubiasi, Aqua Pim, and Latte, Ghana, as well as to the Council of Elders, in fact, our Council of Elders in America in 2021. She is originally from the St. Louis area and migrated to Washington, D.C., the Washington, D.C. area in 1997. She served as an electrical engineer a soldier in the US Army, a personal chef with the expertise in natural and alternative foods, and as a financial services expert. Her mission is to help families realize that financial security is an essential must-have. Please join me in welcoming 
Dr. Vital, Vital, Dr. Vital, also known as Nana Abrafo Henny, Olaquesu, Kwao, Vital, Vital, excuse me, and Akompo Ama Montina, Vital. Thank you both for being here. Appreciate it's our being, pleasure. Appreciate you having us. Ama, okay. How do you teach your son to appreciate feminine energy? <clears throat> That's a good question. <laughs> um, one of the things is, I can truly say that um, that has been very helpful with my husband helping me to teach my son. Um, because I say this as a mother, we always have that. That's our baby. We, you know, we don't want to let go. I mean, you know, the over, you know, oh man, y'all get what I'm saying, right? Absolutely. My <laughs> husband yes. 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 always tells me, take the titty out the mouth. Yes. Come on, sis. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Right. I'm no different than any other woman with a son. My husband had to kind of, kind of like, hey, babe. Uh, you know, you're trying to, excuse me, y'all, I'm going to be raw. Y'all know I can be raw. You're trying to help him grow up a JJ? What you doing? You know what I'm saying? What you doing? That's not what, no, 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 we're not trying to do that. So I had to learn how to help my son understand feminine energy. You know, it was my husband and my son who actually taught me because my son, the oldest is 26, Right. And when he was about 21, he started to be like, Ma, hey, 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 you need to bag up a little bit. You know what I'm saying? You like a little bit too heavy, you know, on the on the mothership. You need to bag up. And it kind of made me feel some kind of way. You know, I'm like, what you mean? I'm your mama, boy. You know, I started feeling some kind of way about that. But then I had to realize when I would go out and evaluate when I would see other young men with their moms. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did uh -huh. you see? Yes, I saw they were like little grown men. You know, it was like they were, they had the children, have didn't have the balance. Right. Boundaries. It was like no boundaries. <clears throat> you know, it was like two grown ups, like a man and a woman, like a relationship. And I was like, oh no, I, I'm not trying to, um, that's not, that's not the way that I want my child or my son to understand feminine energy. You know what I'm saying? Like literally you only knew that they were not mates because the kid would be so young and the, you know, there was an age difference, but the behavior and the interactions between the two, you could not tell. And so that's when I started to be like, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what I want. I want my sons to understand that women are divine, that women have value, that women have uh, a role in your life, in your development, in how you uh, interact with the world. You know, I have a role in how that happens. And it's not the way that I was doing it at first, you know, being overprotective. And, you know, my husband be like, girl, if you don't get back, let him scrape his knee. You know what I'm saying? Y'all mothers know what I'm saying. Man, we went, we went through that trying to push and pull until I really understood it. Once I understood it, I was like, oh, yes, this is where it's at. You know, I sit back now gleaming with pride, seeing my 26, our 26-year-old and even our 12-year-old. I'm like, yeah, you know, like we own something over here. So I'll I'll leave it with that. <laughs> what was the, what was the, let's call it a hair. What was the piece that had you say, I, I gotta do this different. There was something that there was like one thing, if you know, that there, there was a day when it happened. Do you care? Do you hear? I mean, well, do you know I can say personally for my the day that I heard my younger brother, so I come from a huge family of, of um, Papa was a Rolling Stone. So All right, how many so, siblings? Right, I got a name on the count them, but probably about, <laughs> no, nearly, it's nine or 10. Okay. I realized when I was 30, how was I, 30, something about 30? 
about 30 I don't know what when I realized that I was an only child with the same oh, mom yeah, and dad. Yeah, yeah, like a, yeah. I was like grown. I didn't even, it didn't even, I didn't 13. even feel it. And then I said, oh, wait a minute. I'm the only person that's got the same mom and daddy of my, my collective mm -hmm. of brothers and sisters. Yes. But it was when I heard my, one of my brothers talking to his sons, he got all sons. And he has a tendency to whine. And I was like, oh, oh, that's what it's like. Because unfortunately, he was raised by his mother only. And I see a lot of feminine traits in him that but he's, he, but he's very masculine. Very masculine. But is the way that he the was application. The, the application. I saw. I saw that, and I knew. I said, no, 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 no. Got to cut it out. You know, I have to take leadership. I have to. I have to come up under the leadership of my husband, who's telling me that this is not what. This is not how you do it. You know, this is. You have. Um. You have a role, but the way that you're applying it is not it. And when I saw that. That shot that that got me right because I was like, oh no, 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 no. That because that that my brother does, it's like it drives me crazy because it's not effective. And it's just, yeah, that's what it was. When I heard my my younger brother talking to his sons, and it was this whine, it was always whining. It was never, you know, like. He didn't got to be hard and mean, but what he was giving them was not, it wasn't doing it. And I just saw that thing repeating because now his sons communicate and do the same thing. And I'm like, oh no, you know, mm -hmm. so that's what, what it was for me. So got just, it. just real quick. Um, this reminds me of, this is a conversation that I have with my, with my wife in terms of, the the psychological damage and brother Quark, uh to speak probably more to this um in reference to the our black women want to protect their young sons and this is why it's so important for black men to be in their lives because as an entrepreneur you know i have a recycling center where i usually get a bunch of kids come in and they do some work the women most of the, the 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 young boys or even the young ladies that come in are um, single female households, but the women would come in and be like, "Oh, I don't want my son picking up a can, or I don't want my son standing up for two or three hours." <laughs> I'm I'm dead serious um, in terms of and, and this and this producing these type of young men you know they're doing a disservice to them and again you know talks about the psychological effect or the psychological thing that the women are doing to the young boys because there aren't any black fathers or black men in these kids lives which will allow them to see and observe a man's energy so, but I just want to interject that before I forgot. <laughs> so, um, I, but I want to take it. One of the things that we're we definitely want to do. We we don't just want to criticize feminine energy. I mean, and I think we're consistent with this. We haven't been doing that. We want to honor it also. So, Ama, what would you say? What are the what are the beautiful things that you have brought to your son? And I'm I mean I'm sure this is an easy question. Um. <laughs> with feminine energy um let's see sorry there was someone saying they couldn't get onto the link the um oh absolutely the nurturing um uh, our daughter is on zenzele <laughs> <laughs> and uh the relationship that she and her brother share the way that he cares for his siblings uh, he he is so much of a nurturer. Um, he puts he puts them before himself. So those values of, of femininity, I see appropriately being displayed uh, from our from our eldest son to his siblings, and and for me, you know, I'll never forget. He was uh, was he in junior high school when he went to the uh, 
Oh, I'll give you an example. The Batman, the Batman movie. Y'all remember when that man went in the movies and shot up the movie theater? Yeah. After that, after that Batman Colorado movie. Colorado or something like that. Yeah. So yes. why my son, why our son come and ask us to go to the movie theater? That during that time period, y'all know how I was. Just you just know how you were as a parent. I'm like, what? He was not even in high school, I don't think. I think he was in junior high school because he wasn't even driving. Yeah, I don't know. So he was in junior, he was in junior high school. And he was supposed to go to let's say the nine o'clock show or whatever, but the show got sold out. So he went to a later show. Man, he didn't call me, didn't tell. Remember that night? He didn't call me and tell me. I was the one taking them, dropping them off. And you know, what just happened is on my mind. So I'm like, wait, panicking. You know, I ain't hear from him. Uh, he went to a later show. He didn't tell me. And I don't know. It, my mind just was not settled. I jumped up out the bed. Remember I jumped up? I was. I had taken a nap trying to get myself to wait on the phone call to get picked up. He didn't call me, y'all. I jumped up out the bed, went up to the movie theater. I went into the movie theater. I had a flashlight. I was like, look. Y'all, it was crazy. It was so crazy. I went looking for him. I was like, told that man, come on, we coming to find my son. Because he's supposed to tell me what time this movie. But the problem was, it was me and some other women up there doing the same thing. And so we went, I went and got him. And I kind of snatched him up a little bit. He over there giving dap. I said, boy, come on here. You ain't got time to be giving no dap to nobody. And so when we got home, my husband didn't understand. So he was totally like, he didn't understand why I had and how why I reacted that way. But for me, I was hysterical, you know, worried when you talked about protecting. But at the end of that, maybe a couple of days later, it, I don't remember the time, but my son, you know, it wasn't days, it was maybe, maybe some months or something. He came to me and he he apologized to me and he told me, he said, you know. I understand why you did what you did. I, I understand why you came and snatched me out the movie theater. I understand how you could have, what you were feeling. And I apologize for that. You know, I, I understand that I, something like he said, I triggered your, your mama's senses. I had you, you know, I had you in a place that you should not have had to been. And so he told me that, you know, that was not respond, that was irresponsible of me to, to do that, you know, and that's when I was like, wow, you know, like he, he understands, he gets it, you know, and my husband was like, you know, I wouldn't, he told me, I would have never did, you shouldn't have did that, I would never did that, that, you know, you didn't have to handle it that way, but that's the way you handle it. But that's when I knew that I had transferred the proper respect mm for uh, the feminine energy, the feminine emotion to my son, you know, doing yep. that that event, that incident. But man, man, man. It was a moment. What? <laughs> it was a whole moment, a whole moment. I, I wanna take a quick moment to honor my father. And, um, and on, a, on a similar note to what you've just shared, uh, my father is 70, I think my father is 76, no, 77. And his mother raised him from, my, my grandfather passed when my father was one. So my mother, my, my grandmother raised him and, and my uncle, his older brother, their entire lives um, until they got married and all of that good stuff. Um, my father made it a point never to move very far from my mother, my grandmother. He, he lived, I mean, he might've lived two, three miles from her for forever. <laughs> like there was never a time where that wasn't the case. And it may be maybe four miles. Um, and most days he would pick her up. And when, once she retired, he would pick her up and have her with him, whether it's at the house working, my father had his own business. So she was with him often like i mean all the time i try not to use like all but she was with him a lot and i saw him make a point of nurturing her all the time i mean i'll say all i mean it was really a concerted effort of his so i'm honoring the feminine energy and my father by by taking care of his mother 
who never remarried and he, she lived with my father until her passing. Um, and she was about 92 when she passed. So props to my father. Also, I wanna honor Oduwat. It's one of the things that we, um, when we were getting ready for this, this panel discussion, um, she mentioned that she was working with her mother. She had appointments to take to her mother too. And so get this, what, what has been shared so far is Oduwat has been married almost 50 years. So we know she's over 60 and she has a mother that she still has. Like that's a big deal to have, a, to be an elder and have a mother <laughs> that's still with us is a beautiful thing. And, and not only that, but to still be, to take care of her is worth honoring by itself. So Odawa, thank you for sharing that and honor to you and your family. Yeah, my dad lived to 91 and my mom 90, is now 93. And they grew up in Georgia during the time of segregation and lynching. I experienced segregation myself. I don't mind giving that age. If you don't know anything about it, you just don't know. But to experience that and have it right in your face, um, our, our ancestors and relatives, the people who experienced that and went through it and still, and still they rose. I can see why that poem, they, 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 and still I rise. My dad was only of his four brothers and sisters who were able to go to school. He actually finished Howard in 1958, but he was able to get an education because he uh, went to, left where he lived in Savannah to go to where my mom lived in Georgia. And so people, they had their own schools. Black people had their own schools because of, if they didn't, you wouldn't get educated. And so he met my mom and they were married 67 years. He wow. met my mom at school. They didn't get together right away, but he met her as a, as a in, in junior high and middle school. So just to say, you know, they survived. Thank God they have survived through a lot, you know. And again, I think some of the ills that we experience now, some of, you know, trauma, et cetera, is in the DNA. You know, my mom is very, very, always very um, conscious about, you know, a little bit, quote unquote, paranoid. <laughs> but I know they were living in a time where you could be taken from your home and no, nobody could say anything. There was no justice. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful that she has survived and lived that long. Um, I just want to make a comment that you were talking about how your father cared for his mother. And I have to say, or while my husband cared for his mom and his stepmom, his mom lived with us for over 30 years until she passed at 87. And then he moved to Indiana for um, almost three years back and forth caring for his stepmom who raised him from 14 years old. So he he definitely had that awake, even though he's the king, yes. <laughs> he had that nurturing, you know, presence in his spirit to take care of his mothers. And I have to say my sons are, you know, do that with me. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Yes, beautiful. Okay, there's, there's uh... One person we haven't ha asked one of my, my questions to. Wow. So if there's a skill set that you can relay or, or put your finger on that um, captures how you can be married, or how can we be married for over 20 years and, and go through the things that we have to go through, or, I mean, that, that we go through. Um, in a world where masculine energy is in your face, I mean, get more money, uh, more, get more, be bigger, be stronger, win a title, be a champion, those kinds of things. Those things are very prevalent in the conversations that we have. In the, in the world of getting more, how do you navigate a successful relationship? particularly in interjecting some feminine energy, given that masculine energy is so prevalent. Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. 
and without a without a doubt, what I've done, um, I say an idea and a skill set. So the idea is that I always uh, maintained and clarified my purpose. So I always understood what my purpose was. And I only, over time, I gained further clarity on my purpose. And so I built an idea around that that I called uh, the paradigm. And I shared that you know, with my, my children, I inculcated that within them. So it's the relentless um, focus on purpose. And so that singular idea was able to get me through the hardest times. And when I say like, ah, no, I can't do this. Or I always remember the purpose of why I'm here and why I'm doing that. And so just to give, to bring it a little bit out of the abstract, uh, when I say purpose, that's an ancestral idea. So in my value set and my spiritual believing is that I'm coming here to fulfill a purpose. And I'm doing that on, be I'm an agent of my ancestors. And as an agent of my, my ancestors is my duty to solve the problems of my ancestors. And to do that, I have to develop you know, a family unit that's going to be viable. So in other words, if you look at the ancestral, uh, all those who came before you as a corporation, and we were just talking to my son about uh, this idea because he was, you know, he's a, um, what was his position? He's a, he's a, senior, uh, he's a senior. senior accountant for Enterprise Corporation. So he works so, at Enterprise Corporate. And so there are certain uh, enterprise uh, local, rental locations that are under his mm -hmm. uh, purview. And so he goes and does the audits and things like that. And so we were just giving him advice about how to manage, you know, the people that he deals with there. You know, as a psychologist, I would be remiss if I go in and, and counsel other people and don't counsel my own children about, okay, this is, you know, human behavior. This is how you might better navigate this situation. And we were letting him know that those are all your businesses, the ones that you have responsibility for. You have to see them as you have ownership of those. And that if they are viable, you have to convince them that it's their business. And for them to be viable, they have responsibility for that business and they will be fruitful. And if they're fruitful, the whole company will be fruitful. So, and then I took that same idea and I applied it to the whole thing I've been teaching him all his life, the paradigm, the purpose of life. And I said, listen, it's the same thing. Like this family unit, this is our business. And this is my business. And this is why I singularly focused on the development of this business. Because the corporate entities, the ancestors are looking at me, how I'm handling my unit, my business. And so whenever I got into a position like man I can't deal with she out her mind I'm not done I had to go off and the clarity come to me like okay this is your business and so the skill set to answer that so it was that idea and the skill set of of having vision because that's for me that's paramount for a man to have vision you have to have know your purpose understand purpose and have vision and what you're going to see when you have vision is one of the most uh, fundamental things you have to do is recognize value. And you have to, because that, that the, another principle of manhood is expansion, because you're always looking to secure and expand. Secure that, expand. Businesses do that. Any principle of, of masculinity is looking to do that. So you have to see what is the value, valuable territory, what is the valuable uh, resources, so you know where to expand to and how to extract those things, you know, and to secure those things, extract those things to make yourself viable. So coming to the feminine energy, you have to see the sister, the woman who has that value. So I, I the skill set was I identify a woman like that's value. 
And and a lot of times we want to look at things like, oh, uh, you know, I got this tingly feeling, and I love her, and I, that's and we build marriages off of that, and they that tingly feeling it goes away. You know, it's contemptuous, it, it's it's corruptible, but value never goes away. Value is all is is consistent, it always remains, it always can be cultivated. So, and I always had to remember that when I was in in my uh, most frustrated state, <laughs> let's say, and I'm like, I ain't gonna do this. I had to realize that the value never changed. Now, if you're extracting something out of the earth, it's a resource and it's valuable, you know, it's not necessarily gonna cooperate with you. You have to figure out how to get that diamond, how to get those gold, <laughs> go out. You, you see what I'm saying? It's not cooperate. So you what? <laughs> it don't cooperate. All the time. It don't cooperate all the time. So you have to. And so I realized that the minute I was ready to walk away, that was the indication. Even though it might, might have been valid in terms of you know it's legitimate emotion, legitimate feelings that I'm having um, because of what I'm experiencing, it's still a mark of my incompetence. So the, the moment that I say I can't do anymore, I'm just saying that I'm not competent to, to extract this value because there's value here. Absolutely. I can't, <laughs> I'm incompetent. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm competent. <laughs> so I say, okay, let me see. Let's re-strategize. <laughs> so let, let me rethink this, you know? And so that has been the thing that has been able to um, allow me to, to tough through those times. And one thing I want to kind of clarify, because I hear us a lot of times talk about this idea of respect. And I do understand what we talk, what we mean, particularly when women say respect. But I think that women, and we do women disservice when we say that, um, oh, he respects me or, or I, I, I deserve respect or like Aretha Franklin, you know what I'm saying? I, I should be respect. No, you're not you don't respect women you value women and i think that when when the woman is trying to get because the thing that you do to get respect are masculine activities and so if you have the man and the woman vying for respect they're competing against each other for the same thing when it's really not the respect for her it's the value for her that's why i've treated her and why i've maintained and why i've persisted and then as a man, I have to build respect because respect, I mean, you can respect a person who ain't worth a, a spit. They may be a violent brute but because they have power and the ability to sanction and the ability to cause harm to you. You respect them. When they come, you get out the way. But they're not worth a spit. So but value. And that's not value, a relationship. You value want. is pure. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, value, it, it doesn't go away. It's, it's incorruptible. It's always the value is the thing that gives life. And that's what a woman is. She is the life source. She's the water. How are you going to get like, uh, um, uh, uh, Fela? Oh, yeah. Said, yeah. Water has no enemy. Yeah. If water kill your child, you're still going to use it to bathe. You're still going to use it to drink. It's water. So that value never goes away. So that that's the, you know, the skill set, the vision to see the value is what I, I would say well said there's a um, there's a I, I i believe and i say at times that i uh frustration is god's way of telling us that we're not prepared to deal with something yes I and agree. i think that goes exactly to what you just said when you no, realize, when you realize you were frustrated you had to check yourself and say, I got some skills I got to acquire right, right, right. life ain't sharp enough let me right you know. right yes exactly I agree. Okay, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna cut over to the chat for a moment and just give a few comments of um, of what a few people said. Um, uh, Rukia said, "I used to think my husband's choice to not speak when feelings were high was a form of control and passive aggressive because I wanted to talk and control." Um, after seeing him, after seeing him. I think it's, I couldn't, I'm missing a word because of my screen, 
but I, I think it's after seeing him agree with his son or angry with his son, I realized his desire to pause is actually loving and in love. And we talk respectfully to one another as well. Thank you, Rakia. Um, Atiyama Damat said, this conversation feels good. I'm sorry more people are not here. Atiyama Encia said, I appreciate what Andre, An Andrea and Kwesi are saying. They're hitting the points about balance and relationship. Atiyama Dama also said, thank you, Alma, for sharing your observations and your willingness to shift. Uh, this is so very rich. So we're, we're, uh, we're doing good work. We're doing good work here. Uh, uh, Nay Nayoka uh, Samuels Gilchrist says, uh, love that Nana Ama says that her male son exhibits nurturing qualities. Does that make nurturing neither masculine or feminine? And uh, uh, your daughter, uh, Zenzele, uh, this is very true. My, other bro my older brother is definitely se a selfless individual. He prioritizes the success and survival of me and my younger brother. He's a prime example to me of what black masculinity all encompasses. Kudos to mama and daddy. Beautiful. <laughs> Great work. Great work. Doc, Doc, yeah. what do you have to say? Well, I'm glad Jonathan said some of this stuff rather than me, because I would be, as I said, written up in the papers for saying it. But you know, sooner or later, you're going to learn what life is all about, if you haven't learned already. We're born with nothing and we die with nothing and in between is all BS. We have decided it's going to be based on what you can acquire and what you can obtain. But all the clients that come to me, I ask them, are you happy? And they all say, no. Doesn't matter if you're a man, a woman, or, you know, a beast that we feed on. My sense of humor makes me want to say something funny, but it's seriously, you have to laugh because in the final analysis, we come to realize that it's all for nothing. W.E.B. Du Bois said it perfectly. We live in a world that yields us no true self-consciousness. We have no true sense of who or what we are, particularly the African-American. And if you've noticed Africans now in the person of Trevor Noah, for instance, are saying that there's a distinction between African-Americans and Africans. We've lost some of our uh, whatever we had, but in the final analysis, I don't think any of it matters. I don't mean to rain on your parade if you think as people who are filthy rich kill themselves. Indeed. So it's not about obtaining money. Solomon had 600 wives. Are you gonna tell me a man could service 600 women? And I love the thing you said, Jonathan, about um, property. Women have been treated as property throughout history. And in our enlightened state, we still don't know that that doesn't make sense. But the real thing that doesn't make sense to me is women take the time to try to prove that they're not property. Like we as a minority, we spend time trying to prove to the oppressive uh, groups that we're as good as they are. Why do, we, why do we spend our time dealing in vain with something because the goalposts move constantly? I said I wasn't gonna get into all of this my BS, because this is stuff I feel, but I couldn't resist a little bit of it. But I've, I'm hearing some enlightenment. So I just want to tell you, Nina Kopinda, I love all of you. And, um, you know, the struggle continues. Here, here. But we're all wayfaring strangers traveling through this land. 
And the best rendition I ever heard of that was about a white girl called Ava Cassidy. Now, how about that for a joke? <laughs> okay. <laughs> a white girl called Eva Cassidy says, way very stranger that'll knock your shoes off. Because life will no crystal stairs for her either. All right. So I'm, I'm done. Sorry, you know, I didn't mean to get off on the thing. We honor you, Doc, and we, I love you too. Enjoy, the, enjoy. I'm going to open up the floor to the audience. Um, is there, I mean, do, does anyone in the audience want to ask a particular question? If you do, you can raise your hand right now. You can just, you could jump in. And if you don't, I will continue to run my mouth. Oh, can I tell you one more thing? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, okay, Fisk is music. The Fisk Jubilee Singers, even though they have a medical school, but they are really known for the Fisk Jubilee Singers who traveled all over the world and raised money to maintain a HBCU. Wow. Okay. And Tuskegee had a few airmen down there. So that's, that's, that's really the distinction, but as a creative person, Fisk was the one that I lord. That's uh, right, Fisk like forever. Absolutely. Oh, Spelman, Spelman, Spelman's got singers too. <laughs> Those girls down in Spelman kick butt. Not like the Jubilee singers, but they are right. <laughs> they are. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> Auntie Ahmed Duma. I don't have a question. I have a comment, and I am very grateful for this conversation. I think it's so rich, and I hope, as an elder, I urge everyone that's here to please duplicate this conversation in your community. We need this. We're hungry for this, you know. And I think that um, the the belly we're in the belly of the beast, and if we're not careful, we'll fall into some of the behaviors that you see these other folks doing. And we really need to learn from each other and from the families who are making it and surviving in spite of all of the negative environmental influences. I'm loving this conversation and I'm hoping, I, I think you're recording it. I'm hoping that um, it can be duplicated and shared. Our community needs this. So thank you so much Akom Kesi for doing this. And thank you all of the people who, I don't know if y'all see me, I'm a cheerleader here. I'm cheering y'all on. It's, this, is, this is very rich. I'm enjoying it. I'm full. I'm glad that this is happening. Enough said. Uh, sure. Thank you. And we have part two coming up, and we have a part two and three coming up in the months to come. So we will we will definitely keep pushing the envelope. Um, a comfort quabana. Hey, I just want to say um, this conversation is, is truly powerful. I'm learning a lot, and um, I guess also you know evaluating myself and my relationship, you know, with my wife. And I, I think one of the things that um, I think clearly uh, y'all are pointing out, you know, we, we we talked about, I guess, being in the belly of the beast and it's looking at just where we are in America and the brother was talking about the distinction of, um, the brother was talking about the distinction between Africans and, and African-Americans. Well, I guess looking at our relationships, you know, in, in America, everything that we, we are dealing with has really been compromised, you know, by enslavement. You know, we talk about epigenetics and all of that muck and mire of us being here under white supremacy and domination, you know, those, um, those traumas have impacted how we look at ourselves and how we deal with each other in, in our relationships. And um, white supremacy, you know, it has many, many forms, many fashions, and, and it and it's, it's, uh, has set the tone for a lot of the, the um, relationships that we have right now. We gotta really take a look at that and analyze that and not just take a look at the epigenetic harms, but what it has what has it done to us in our relationships? How, how are we defining ourselves? Um, are we in competition with our mates? Are we hostile to our mates? So as we have this, this conversation, um, as we're moving forward, um, we definitely need to take a look at that, ju just where we are, what has happened to us, and how that plays out in our relationships. Medassi. Only Pacho. 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 Auntie Ama, if but I can't just let me follow up with a call real quick. Um, we've got a we've got a, a 
good, healthy number of um, uh, mental health professionals here in the in the in the space. And uh, so we know we know two of them. And a Kwabena is another one. He has a significant history and uh, he, his his field is social work. Um, a Kwabena, would you tell us about epigenetics? What is it? Why does it matter? Yeah, I'll just be, you know, be, be brief about that. Um, and everyone to get a chance, go up to the uh, Encobra's website. And uh, I'm on the Encobra Health Commission with the Black Social Workers. And there's a whole study that Encobra just commissioned last year that came out on epigenetics. But the, uh, the field of epigenetics really came about looking at the Holocaust survivors and, and how um, uh, a generation or two after uh, Auschwitz and, and the, the concentration camps how the offspring were having many of the uh, the symptomology of the of the, um, the parents and grandparents that were dealing with the traumas uh, in um, in Germany and and also in Eastern Europe, and the studies were very conclusive in finding out that with those traumas, the anxiety, depressions, bipolar disorders, and even some of the uh, the physical manifestations, that the traumas actually uh, changed or impacted uh, the DNA markers. And so even though the child, the grandchild, or the offspring of that particular parent or grandparent may not have necessarily um, experienced the, uh, uh, the trauma, the genetic markers were passed down and, and kind of uh, had the same impact as the person that experienced the original trauma. So with that being said, um, with our people being here in America 404 uh, years, uh, we haven't had any real, real formalized treatment or really conversations about enslavement. We talk about it um, uh, sidebar conversations, and we really haven't put a context in uh, of the epigenetics and how that has impacted us 404 years here in America. So I think this is really the next phase of our conversations of how we're healing ourselves and now putting in systems in place that to uh, acknowledge epigenetics and, and putting cultural dynamics, spiritual dynamics in place, but we can kind of reverse that, that, that reverse those dynamics and bring our people back to their optimum uh, form of, of, uh, of balance. Medassi. Yo. Auntie Alma, the floor is yours. Darcy, I want to say thank you to everyone who presented today. It was excellent. I wanted to co-sign on what Comfort Kwabana said, and some others, Ipacho, if I don't remember your names, but they also touched on it. And I think the basis of what we have to get back to are the traditional roles of men and women. Um, we have completely adopted a Western culture um, and philosophy in terms of our relationships. And I think it continues to get further and further away from what we would have done traditionally in, in parts of West Africa. I don't know about the whole of the continent, but I know if I look at my um, um, uh, people, ancestors, I can see the clear role that men and women play. And we really, really need, need to get back to that. Then you would see what Brother Vital and Kwesi and Mo, the families that spoke, you will see a lot of what they said in that tradition. And that's what we have to get back to. So I thank you all again for bringing this to the forefront. And it is a conversation that I think needs to be continued. I only pray that the people who really need to hear what's being said are able to be here to hear it. <laughs> Let's ask you. Yes, it does. Uh, Brother Yao Barrington, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. I wanted to um, thank you and the organizers who pulled this together because um, if you look at where we are as African people in this, this country, um, it's the circumstances are dire. And I keep on thinking, you know, Nana Kwao and I are brothers and we talk all the time. And the importance of us digging deep and exploring the psychological and emotional aspects of who we are is, is a key. Like the sister just said, we, we have to, I always keep on saying we gotta have a hard reset in terms of relationships, in terms of what we think they are, in terms of how we deal with women, how women deal with us. Because um, 
our futures as African people in this this hemisphere is at stake. As it's, is at stake. So I'm I'm very grateful that um we got a chance to see this, and I also hope that more people get to experience this and learn as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, and thank yeah. you. Yes. Um, can I? I would like to add uh, on to what um, Auntie Ama Willock said um, because what I've experienced throughout formulating a relationship with my with my husband, um, society really has given us the wrong lenses to see through. You know, I've had experiences out here in the world with white men and it just, it just, you know, a lot of the things that they say about us are things that they place on us for us to react a certain way so that they can have these mantras to say like uh, angry black women, you know, the angry black woman. Well, they created the angry black woman. And then when the angry black woman is displayed, they're wagging their finger. And they're talking about how we are masculine. So they talk about us being, being masculine with one hand, then they say we're not feminine with the other. And what I've learned is that we have to come together in true sisterhood, right? We have to have a true sisterhood where we are truthful with one another, where we talk about how... Um, you know, they talk about the cosmic, the cosmic dissonance in psychotic, that's real, right? That is so real. And it's real for us as black women, because when I was going through, um, when my husband and I were, were, were dating and building and doing all of this, it was not no roses, right? But the problem was that the people that I was looking to, to help me navigate the, 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 the difficulties, because I've always believed him 100%, even at 20 years old, I believed him when he said to me, no, you are my wife. I just met you right too early. So now I have to revamp the way I saw myself moving. I had a time and a place when I was going to be ready for a wife. You just came too freaking early, right? You just, you just disrupted my whole something. So he came to me with honesty, with truthfulness, and I believed him. But it was the people that I loved the most in my ear, sisters, black women, grandmothers, mothers, aunties, cousins, friends who damaged me to tell me I was a fool. You stupid. He going to do this to you. He going to get his PhD. He going to leave you. They made it so hard for me to really act on what I believed and, and how I wanted to support this brother that I'm still with to this day. So I'm saying a true sisterhood needs to be, we need to, we need to form a true sisterhood where we're going to be truthful with each other from the core, because I'm telling you, that is the reason that a lot of us are struggling right now today because of all this old mess from people and we don't have a true sense. I'll never forget. We went and picked up a, um, he bought, you know, I, I'm a cook chef. I love the kitchen and all things kitchen. So I said, babe. I want a new refrigerator. And he was like, okay, $2,500 refrigerator, y'all. He was like, no problem. Girl, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so he bought How me. you get him just to say, okay? Girl, listen, I'll tell you later. We got to hey, talk. Share. Like you said, we the neck and we can get that head to turn left and right. You're Come right, on. You're right, you're Come right. On. I ain't spending <laughs> no $2,500. <laughs> <laughs> he bought me yeah. a refrigerator. Just like that. We weren't even in the market for a refrigerator. I saw it. I said, I want it. He said, no problem. Came and loaded. We came to pick it up. This young white guy worked at Lowe's, right? At, at a place that's predominantly white in the area. He, I was outside with the receipt. And my husband went and got the truck, pulled the truck up so that, so that they could load the refrigerator onto the truck. I'm just standing there with the receipt, like making sure they don't damage my refrigerator. You know, that's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. And this little white guy going to start engaging me, talking about some, um, and he was dead serious. He was not playing. He was serious. Talking about, yeah, so um, you guys can, um, you know, back the truck up and, you know, load the refrigerator up. I said, excuse me. 
<laughs> Who load the refrigerator up? Yeah, yeah, you guys. I said, ain't no you in that. I said, honey, I ain't loading no refrigerator up. You must be talking about a tar refrigerator. I ain't putting my <laughs> thing on damn parts. Oh, no, you can handle it. I said, no, how about you put your work boots on and you come over here and you help him load this refrigerator? He was dead serious, but that moment taught me. I just, it just clicked. They see us as men. And then I remember what they were saying about uh, Michelle Obama. I remember what they were saying about uh, Serena Williams. They was they 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 want to mass they want to uh, defeminize us as women, you know. And I refuse. I refuse. Let me tell you something. He went on and turned red and left me alone. I was not playing. No, what? Because I knew what he was doing. And so what I'm saying is we have to we have to give that the side hand. We have to put that away from us because that, you know, I used to get upset. We used to listen, y'all. This y'all see me. This is me. All right. This is me. This is my energy. Brother ain't had no cakewalk. <laughs> I'm still being honest. Can I just be I'll real say. parents? <laughs> he had somebody say to him. Man, uh, I'm a man. I don't know. I don't know how you I'm dealing with dude. that. Said, I'm a dude. And I've had I've had people, black and white, like when I used to work with, for these white guys, they were saying it to you like, man, I'm uh, I'm a man. I don't know how you fool handling her, you know. But what I realized, that's not cute, right? I realized that that wasn't cute, but that's what that's what we as black women in America in particular are made to honor when we can get all up in somebody's face and we can tell you what side to go up and down on. That's not cute. That's what we believe. It was my husband that made me understand that men don't talk to men like that. Because when men talk like that, ain't no talking. It's a, <laughs> it's a breath and a speed loss. And so he's like, listen, you cannot be all that ain't no don't do that because you jeopardize in my life because the minute a brother rolled up on you is lights out for him and i was like mm, okay so you know but that, being that's, dainty that and is, quaint is is that's what's I'm, cute and that's what i'm trying to I'm trying to be no i'm not trying to be moving no refrigerators and all that i want to be cute i don't wear nails but i'm gonna <laughs> act like i got some on you know what i'm saying I had to translate. I know that's right. I had to put it in my mind. That's armor energy. That's armor energy. (laughs) Yes. And you know something that I noticed? That warrior energy. I think Auntie Hamadama mentioned it. And that Yasantua energy is real with us. And it's okay. But guess what? You know what always happens? The men stand right behind us and fear that sucker to come near his, his, his wife. Because like you said, there will be no talking. I'm just going to knock you out. I'm coming at you. But that's the role. That's the role. That's our role. And that's their role. We fight, but we fight differently. That's true. And the other thing I had to learn is not to fight my protector. This society will trick you. This society (laughs) will trick you into believing. Like we'll have conversations. I'm just being real transparent, y'all, because I'm telling you, this is something because that young lady that's sitting right there, Zenzele, it is my my goal and my and our son, Borkum, for them to have the proper mates. I understand now why they were having uh uh what you call uh made ups where they, they you got this pool of people and you you choose from this pool. I understand that. I understand it. We thinking, oh, you got to be free spirit. They need to choose their own love. is blind. No, love ain't blind. Love's going to be structured. <laughs> if I got anything to do with it. And I'm, I'm just I'm just saying, y'all, listen, I'm just... Y'all I'm see just, what I deal with? Just, <laughs> right. <laughs> I think y'all can see what I deal with, right? Okay. Okay. All right. Let me jump in here real quick. Email energy. Things, my brother, you deal with it, right? Right. Email <laughs> energy. Yeah. But, Can but I just say that I do want to impress upon us? Um, is that, hold up. Wait a second. Let, yes. Let's do what I, I, I just want to say one thing. I know Ama and I miss you and I enjoy you and I know Barbara Quile. And I will say from my observation, you complement each other perfectly. It's oh, a complementary okay. relationship. It's not, you know, you have your energy, he has his, but it complements. So there's that that's one of the greatest things you can have is interdependence and inter uh 
relationship complement. So, you know, opposites often attract and often can actually learn how to work well together. So I see you working well together and it's nothing wrong with you having the energy that you have and it's nothing wrong with him having the energy he has. And, and one of the things he said that was really, really important is knowing your purpose. If you know your purpose and if you know what your values are, then you always have something to fall back on when there's adversity because adversity is going to be there. It's always going to be there. It's always going to come. It's never going to be a situation where you might not encounter any adversity. So when the adversity is there and you're complimenting each other, then you've got everything covered. It's all covered. It's no problem. And, and one of the things someone said, I don't remember who said, oh, the people, um, something about people and being happy. But I want to say that, you know, there's a song I wrote. Happiness is a decision. It's not a destination. Mm. Happiness is a decision to enjoy your incarnation. So you're here for this period of time. And it's your decision and it's your uh, purpose to de determine your happiness. Nobody can do that for you. Not even this crazy bestial environment that we're in. Mm -hmm. Nothing can determine that for you. You have to determine it for yourself. We got a few quotables. So that was yes, put that nice. down. Happiness is the decision to enjoy our incarnation. Did I get yeah. that right? Yeah. It's on my it's on my voicemail. It's okay. a song. Right. <laughs> There's more to it too. Really it's not a destination. That's the main thing. People feel like if I get this, I'm gonna be happy. If mm -hmm. I get that, I'm gonna be happy. If I'm if I do this, or if I'm with that person or that person, no one person can determine that for you. Because you can be with the one you love and still, quote unquote, not be happy because you didn't decide to be happy. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't have flaws. That doesn't mean that you don't have to look to self-improve and that your mate should be looking to improve themselves. That doesn't mean that. But Nobody can steal your happiness and your peace and joy unless you allow it. Yeah, yeah. Can I say something to kind of uh, wrap up a few things that are follow up with a few things said by Nana Amawila and a few other people? Is that about my wife's energy? So to be clear, I like her energy. I like the, the spice and the, you know, I like the, the sister girl. I like the the head going and the earrings pop. Out. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> you know what I'm so I actually like that. But I think uh Sister Andrea says something very important when she said that um that she trusts uh Quasi, you know, and I think that and then um uh brother Quavin or Corporal Quavin uh spoke about the epigenetics and uh spoke about the generational trauma that we have mm -hmm. and that our women have and uh i know for um and this is probably for another conversation another uh live um my wife's own personal trauma history that trust becomes distorted mm -hmm. and so all of the the spice and the flair that i like in her and then when it turns on me in the inappropriate or unwarranted way, that's when I say, hey, okay, I like that, but I, I'm the one you trust. But trust had been you know, damaged before. So that energy, it's, it's not that it, it should go away because uh, like Dr. Um, Ballard said that uh, men and women have masculine energy within ourselves. When you are born with the womb, that is your uh, ancestral assignment that you are to embody more of the feminine qualities and you will temper that with uh some masculinity where appropriate because you see uh nothing is more fierce than a, than a lion or, or a bear female bear, protecting her cubs so women and womb people have that masculine energy they have to have it so any entity has to, this living has to have it and the same thing with a man we take that feminine energy and we refine our bruteness and we become gentlemen. Mm -hmm. 
in that respect. And so, so we become the best and most valued of men is, is the one who has, is able to temper and to refine his, his masculinity with the feminine uh, qualities. So I think it, it's important to say that, you know, and, and I don't think that and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think that she's saying that we should, uh, that black women should not have that that pizzazz that she has and oh, no 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 i'm but saying she said, shouldn't but they shouldn't turn it against you right. know our protector our provider and, and that's what i've and, learned and you know people from other societies take that and distort that yes. because of the traumatized yes uh history of uh, the trauma histories personal and you know uh social and ancestral that our women have been in battle with and they try to pretend and theme like our women don't have femininity right when they do they have the best femininity right that's exactly what i'm what i was saying yes thank you okay as we wrap it up i'm going to i'm going to tell the panelists what the question is and then we'll go down the, the line and everybody can weigh in i would like a good movie or a good book that captures something beautiful positive around feminine energy and so I'm going to go first. My favorite movie, not my favorite kind of movie. My favorite movie is Love and Basketball. The, the, um, the protagonist was a sister. She was a beautiful sister. She had a beautiful spirit. She, and, and I love the, the role that her mother, Alfie Woodard, played in her life and in the life of the family. I just, the, the movie, you know, it did it for me. <laughs> Now I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the first person that I know has a book in mind because he's just a book guy. Doc, what you got? <laughs> I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I'm drawing a blank. I, there's so many are in my mind. I'm more I'm more into music, but um, or a song. I, I was I well. You are so beautiful to me. Is is a song. But my wife was into um, the Oriental culture. She's African American, but she was into the Oriental culture. And I loved the, the movie, the old movie, Sayonara. Okay. And does, uh, what does it capture? What's the sentiment that, that resonated with her or you? The interracial love. Um, and it was about. Um, how American GIs went to China and basically um, prostituted the women. And a couple of GIs actually fell in love to the point where they wanted to be married and they were ridiculed. And um, just the tragedy of human beings feeling better than, feeling other people are less than, and the grace of the women. Matter of fact, uh, I can't remember who was in it, but anyway, that that would be my movie choice, mainly because of Natalie, your wife. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Oduwat, you have a book in mind. You might have even written the book you're about to say. <laughs> you're on mute. Oduwat, you're on mute. The main book is out of print. Um, I've written a few songs, but not book. Okay. Uh, the main book is out of print. Black. I don't know if it's the case for everybody, body, but. Yeah, she's frozen. Maybe ask her to type it into the tech in the chat because we can't okay. hear her. Okay, Odu. We missed, we're missing what you just said. And she's, okay. Okay, so if you can type it in the chat, would you let us know there? Now? Yes, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so the movie is um, Something the Lord Has Made. And it's a movie uh, featuring Mos Def and Gabrielle Union. Mm. And it's about, uh, it's a true story about the brother who um, learned how to craft it a way to save blue babies 
but mm -hmm. the white doctor took the credit, but it was the black man who did it. But what I saw in that movie was how Gabrielle Union portrayed his wife. She was so gracious. And they, not that they didn't have problems because they were living in a situation of, you know, a discrimination. But she just, the way she portrayed his wife as being very dignified and very um, supportive of her husband, despite all of the trials and tribulations of discrimination that they had to face. So that's why I, I saw that, you know, because that's love when you so, show support. That's love when you keep uh, displaying dignity and allow him to have his dignity, despite the fact that he's being castrated in front of your eyes. So I Got appreciated it. that movie. Thank you. And I, I, I just as a quick aside, as I was talking to Odawat about being on this panel, she said, why did you, why did you ask me to be on the panel? <laughs> And I said, because you're you, because <laughs> you're you're an elder, you are you've been married to your husband for as long as I've known, and you are a leader. You're a leader in our community. You're a leader in the 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 community that I've grown up in, um, and you embrace you embrace feminine energy in a way that's that's absolutely honorable. So how could I not ask you to be on this panel? <laughs> <laughs> well, so. thank you, Yao. Thank you, Yao. I'm among, I'm amongst a lot of leaders and beautiful people. So I appreciate yes. everybody. I love you. Yes, I love you too. And thank you. Andrea, Andrea, I'm sorry. What do you got? What's your movie or book or song? Yeah, I think they moved okay, away okay. from their camera gotcha. right now. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, um, Wait, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. We're, we're in the middle of driving. But I am. I co-sign on Love and Basketball, absolutely. And I love that relationship to where she had to learn her own energy and not necessarily subdued her energy, <laughs> but she learned her own energy so she can be there for her mate and in turn he also had to learn his energy so he can be there for her but one of my favorite all-time movies and book is called the joy luck club mm. and it's a story about four asian women and their journey to america and all the things they had to sacrifice and their femininity but also how they had to relate to their modern daughters to let them know their struggles so they can learn from their struggles and realize that you can embrace your femininity without being that quote unquote masculine role and pushing away your mates. Thank you. What, was the, movie, what was the movie again? The Joy the Luck Joy Club. Club, but oh, it's also okay. a book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Quasi, what you got? Uh, I don't got nothing. Um, I do like love and basketball. But I can't think of anything right now. Okay. You know you like waiting to exhale when Angela burned all those clothes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, Ama, what do you have? Um, we're going to go together on this. I'm not a book movie. I'm not a big movie watcher. I'm sorry. I don't watch TV like literally. I do not. But we did see this movie. It's a little bit. It's a little sci-fi. It's a little sci-fi movie, but the, but the message of the movie, um, it's called Mother. The title was just called Mother, and um, from that, it really displays the feminine mother energy, and show how selfless, uh, a selfless being or that selfless energy the power of that selfless energy and that you want to um, add yeah, to that. Yeah, because the main character in the movie uh, had a relationship with a robot as her mother. So mm -hmm. 
it, it, basically the, the the gist of the movie is what you know mankind was so totally wrong that you know they had to get this ai to re you know uh was, was programmed to re program humanity or, really. or do a hard set as as y'all bearing to yeah it does a hard, a hard set, set. Mm -hmm. hard and reset reset mm -hmm. and so it had this one young little girl that was being yeah. trained and basically and there was one other woman that was left alive but that one other woman that was left alive embodied so much masculine energy that you know the ai had eventually had to take her out but uh but what was nurtured or cultivated in this young uh girl was the idea of being selfless so she survived and was a, was going to be the mother of the new mother of you know mankind because of her selfless nature and it makes it reminds me of this i don't know if any of y'all seen this meme but there's a meme where um it's, it's i guess it's like a little video clip that shows a rooster uh at a trough and it's eating and the hen is also at the trough but the rooster, he's going to town. He's just eating, 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 eating. But the hen is some little chicks down below next to her feet. And she'll eat one and she'll drop one to the chick. She'll eat one and she'll drop one to the chick. And the rooster just eat, eat, eat so, And she drop one to the chicks. And so the meme says that this is why Mother's Day will always be more important than Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and so... And that movie kind of I um embodied that idea, you know, that you know, that that's a core principle of femininity, that selfless you know, energy, you know, and that is what the reason why we're all here because of some woman's selflessness, you know, ushered us forward, you know. And when that gets disrupted, we have problems to some extent. Another movie, uh, I know my daughter likes this movie, Avatar. And it talks about the, you know, the great mother and how it, it presents it as that is our core value that has to be protected, you know, th that mother principle. So I think those are two good movies that, that kind of highlight femininity. So high, Thank you. High level. Auntie Alma DeMoss said, I have a song and I don't know the pronunciation, but I'm going to say it. You want me to sing it? Sure. Abby Odun of The Last Poets wrote this poem in response to a play. I don't really want to say the title of the play. Everybody probably knows it, but he's saying, uh, we got to have faith in each other. We got to have faith in ourselves. We got to be real sisters and brothers. We ain't got time to act like nobody else. We got to build a new world for our children and teach them how to live and love who they are. We got the power and will to determine about where we're going and exactly how far. We gotta have faith in each other. We gotta have faith in ourselves. We gotta be real sisters and brothers. We ain't got time to act like nobody else. Hey, 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 That's hey, Brother Abby hey, 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 All right. You know you have to send that to me now. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get I gotta that. get Dune to sing it. I... <laughs> okay, a few more comments from the chat. I'm going to read as a, we round out, and please forgive me for running over a little bit. But um, let's see. Uh, Miranda said, "Mrs. Vi Vital, your energy is felt. Your authenticity and transparency is beautifully refreshing. This dialogue is much needed in our community." Uh, um, um, Nisi said, Ama energy is ancient warrior energy that is a force to reckon with because we have always had to protect our sons and men. And the last one I will read is from a coach, Wahavi, that said, thank you so much for this. As a single young person, these conversations not only hold me accountable, but also provide a map to understand the value of my femininity and identify the true masculinity around me. The lessons are taught in school, social media, et cetera, are far from the truth. And lessons here are often and often and often feel and lessons here often feel draining and taxing. However, today I've received messages that fill me and give me tools to work on moving forward. Thank you, everyone. All right. Along today's journey, uh, you've been well. You've been listening to uh, Colm Kessie's lecture series, and we've been talking about 
Black femininity in America. And specifically, we, uh, our show was titled, our, our, our series, our session today was titled Leadership and Submission. So along today's journey, we've discussed honoring our elders, the, the powerful example that single Black men are showing with nurturing and simply honoring feminine energy in a masculine construct. So thank you for my distinguished panel, our distinguished panel for being here. Everyone has been a, a true contributor. I hope the audience has had as much fun as I've had hanging out with today's ensemble and listening and participating. And I wish that you all walk away from this conversation with a heaping helping of useful information that'll help you create a loving relationship and, and a loving and successful and long lasting relationship. Please let us know what you thought of today's show. Um, you could put that in the chat. You can shoot us an email. And if you want more information about Akon Kesi, you can always visit aconcenter.org. That's aconcenter.org. I'm Yao Tyus, board member of Akon Kesi. It's an honor to have been here. It's an honor to have served you. And I look forward to the next session. Take care.